Jag skulle vilja presentera Saskia Sassen som är en professor i sociologi. Hon har skrivit ett antal inflytelserika böcker som har påverkat tror jag, inte bara den akademiska världen utan hur många tänker kring urbaniseringsfrågor och migrationsfrågor i hela världen. Hon kommer senast kom igår från Kina från G20. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that uh, we're so happy to have you here and that you just flew in from China last night and are on your way further on to New York uh, tomorrow and we're just so delighted that you made the extra little trip up here to Viksha to, to speak to us today. Please, you're welcome. Train trip. <laughs> I arrived from Shanghai yesterday and I thought, oh, I'll just go to Stockholm. Luckily, I double-checked and I realized, no, you're not going to Stockholm. <clears throat> so, um, so here's what I would like to address, and it is really different from what has preceded. Um, I have long worked on immigration. I am an immigrant myself. My first job in the United States was as a cleaning woman, though I confess it was partly adventure. Huh? But still, I did that work. I worked very hard. Uh, so immigration has been a very deep subject for me besides some of my other subjects. We tend to, we, we humans, we academics, we whatever, but basically we humans, we tend to construct subjects, sujet, huh? I don't mean a subject as a, as a theme, but I mean uh, the immigrant, the refugee. Today we have two formal subjects in law. Huh? which capture migration. The argument that I want to make is that there is an emergent third subject. That third subject does not exist in law. When that third subject appears at our border, she is invisible. Doesn't matter how material she is. She cannot be captured. So I think that we are really headed into a moment when this new kind of migration is happening. And I want to argue that what lies behind that new migration is a massive loss of habitat. We have spoken about the Anthropocene. I think many of you know that term, right? We have entered a new era. The Anthropocene is a new era. Uh, and this subject is a very fragile subject. And it is not recognized, so this to me is a very serious kind of condition. Now, the two formal subjects we have, the refugee and the immigrant, the, in the case of the refugee, as we know, it's a formal regime in law, produced, generated by the conditions of two world wars. It needs revision. It's getting a bit old and stodgy. It cannot quite capture the full meaning of what. It is, it is, it is too connected to a particular kind of conventional war, World War I, World War II in the West. But today we have a different kind of war. We have asymmetric war. Asymmetric war urbanizes war. War moves to a very large extent to cities. When the United States invaded Iraq, major, major mistake, you know, it will never be forgiven, I think. It should never be forgiven. Oh, yes, my tea. Oh. Can I take him with me to New York? <laughs> All right, if I may, how can I not take a sip? So when the United States invades Iraq, it needs six weeks to destroy the Iraqi army. And then began a new type of war, the war that moves into the cities, into the Fallujahs, into uh, Baghdad, etc., etc. And that war has not ended. 
11 years, the United States has actually, believe it or not, been trying to get out of that war. But it can't. There is no armistice option. You know what I mean by armistice, right? To have an armistice, you need a few very powerful people, leaders of powerful countries, think World War I, think World War II, who sit around a table and say, okay, enough of this, let's go back to business. That happened after World War I, that after World War II. Today, that is not an option. Secondly, the theater of war becomes extremely ambiguous. Okay, maybe the heart might be, you know, Iraq now, Syria, etc. But the shadow effect is huge. Look at the attacks in Paris, the attacks in New York, but Casablanca, Bali, you know, all those forgotten, the bombings in Madrid. The theater of war can depend on one person who creates something. In the case of Madrid, the famous bombing of the train station, that was seven poor, marginal, uh, non-Spanish immigrants. They just did it. It was an amazing that it worked. It's actually amazing. So what happened in München not too long ago? One person. The police in München thought there were several people. That one person killed several and paralyzed the whole city. So what we are dealing with right now is an extraordinarily serious issue. Now, I want to shift to that third subject. So, I, so just to repeat, the regime that we have to recognize uh, refugees needs uh, modernization, let's say. It needs to be changed a bit, huh? but at least it exists. And as you know, the estimate is we have 80 million basically displaced people, of which over half now are children. It's just extraordinary. And we have many third generation, of course. Yeah. Then there is the immigration law, which is a national law. We need an international regime. And the national law is rather dodgy, as the Brits say. You know the word dodgy? It's a very useful word, certainly for this subject. <laughs> and so it, you know, it is quite arbitrary, open to extraordinarily diverse interpretations. Who's the, who's the immigrant, etc. And it's simply, you know, it, it, it needs, it's like, like the human, like the UNHCR regime, it needs revision. My third subject is a subject who is a refugee from a variety of conditions that are neither war nor are they the traditional migrant. I think of the traditional migrant as a strong subject. She leaves behind a place. She might go back to that place. She wants to contribute to that place. That's, that's a, it's a strong subject. And remember, migrants are a little, little minority of all people. Most people do not migrate, emigrate. Eh? They do not leave their countries. So the migrant is a very special kind of subject. The refugee might be strong, typically far more highly educated than the native populations. You know that many of the people who are coming from Syria, from Afghanistan, from, um, from Iraq, have above average levels of education. So that is also a very interesting subject. This third subject is a subject, I think, that is beginning to tell us a story that is a bit frightening and a bit disturbing. This is a subject produced... It, it is a subject that belongs to, to the Anthropocene, you know, the, the massive destruction of habitat that we have produced. It is also a subject that is being displaced and thereby generated by new forms of economic development. Plantation agriculture that replaces smallholder agriculture. The smallholder knows how to give the land a long life generations and centuries. Plantation agriculture doesn't care at all about the land. It goes in there, eliminates all kinds of, you know, fa faunas and floras, and kills the land very quickly. And then, we, and then we have flooding. We have the expansion of mining. Think of the seven elements that are necessary for our electronic revolution. You know, it has created a lot of destruction. That's a brutal kind of mining. 
that leaves behind, you know, poisoned water. And so one of the <clears throat> one of the the chapter that most engaged me in my book Expulsions is uh, the cha chapter that I call "No Commas, No Nothing: Dead Land, Dead Water." I think that the language of climate change is almost too pretty. You know, climate change, it just sounds so beautiful. The words are really beautiful, you know, climate change. We need hard language. So I speak of dead land, dead, dead water. Um, well, here it is, okay. So I want to just show you a few slides. So, so, so let me just jump into the subject here. Here are some of the new migration flows that I'm looking at. I wonder if we could lower the lights a bit more. Aha. Uh -huh. That got a quick. Can can that be done? So it's just not the the visuals are not so good. So here are um, you know these new flows that signal the making of new hist. Just lower it down. Is that possible? I sorry for adding to your troubles and. Okay, maybe that's already better, right? So here, uh, so so let me just backtrack. So I see. Um, uh, three new flows, three new types of flows. So one flow comes from Central America, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and Salvador, not Mexico. And it is very specific. It is of children, unaccompanied children, not children migrating with their parents. Now, you understand they have to cross the whole of Mexico. That's tough. So the counts that we have, which is probably about 150,000, this is quite recent, a new type of migration, that count is probably a severe undercount. We don't know those who die. We don't know those who are kidnapped and are sent into trafficking networks. There's a lot that we don't know. Um, so here are some of the... Ay, well, that was fast. This is jumping a bit. Uh, so here are the sources. So here what I want to emphasize is that Mexico sees a decline. This is just unaccompanied children. And these are apprehensions, so captures. In other words, who knows what all else is going on, right? Who are not? But the apprehensions tell a very interesting story. Is there a pointer here? No. But anyhow, those three lines that go up, those are those three Central American countries. And Mexico goes down. Well, Mexico is not as high up. It's already higher up. And then something happens in this particular year, which is the following. And then goes down. And now it is back up again. And what happens there is that the United States government tells the Mexican government, how about you guys controlling your southern border? Now, we know that the United States border operation is quite brutal, but it's actually kindergarten compared to what the Mexicans, I don't want to offend any Mexicans in the audience, okay, but that was extraordinarily brutal. That fall is that the Mexicans created, and it's of course a much smaller line, it's a shorter line than the United States, that was absolutely brutal to the point that the United States was put under enormous pressure to lift that notion, to make an end to it. Um, so here, then you have what you know. This, this basic. This is just the three Central American. Um, now, again, we don't know. You know who doesn't who doesn't uh, show up on that on that map. We don't know that. Uh, this migration continues. The question is, uh, why are these unaccompanied children migrating? And the answer that they basically give, they don't say, "I'm search of a better life." Never. They don't say that ever. You know, this notion of the migrant, I want a better life. Never. They say, I'm afraid. I have fear. Now, the explanation then has developed according to the following lines. Gang warfare, violence in the city. So, violence in the city, number one, it has always a bit existed. Now it has escalated terribly. So, to give that as an answer, to me, is insufficient. I have to ask why, ladies and gentlemen, why suddenly so much more violence? Violence is made. It doesn't just fall from the sky. You know, it's not like a rain, whatever. Oops, there it is. No, 
We made it. And the question for me then is, how was it made? How were those conditions that are experienced as extraordinary violence, which it really is, the capitals of those cities are along with a particular area in Yemen, the absolutely most violent, with the most numbers of people killed in the world. So the fact of violence cannot be denied. The question is to say violence, to take that as the explanation, that is insufficient. I hope I'm sort of clear with what I'm saying. So I then looked at, well, what happened in the rural areas? Well, the rural areas, enormous land grabs by the United States, enormous death of land, poisoning of land due to mining, due to plantations, etc., etc. Massive numbers of people, small farmers, etc., thrown off their land, they wind up in the city. In the city, there is nothing to do for them, basically. And so violence emerges. In other words, what I'm trying to argue is that usually what you hear is that the explanation is a very early on violence, okay. <laughs> it's not enough, you know, and I feel that we really must go digging. So I hope that that is clear. In other words, that violence in the city that leads to those kids trying to get to the United States was partly made by the United States, given how it handled smallholders. Smallholders are small farmers. They were thrown off the land, the land was grabbed, etc., etc. So the violence is not just the violence of that which is happening in the capitals of those cities. It is also the violence that was produced and that gets measured as economic development. Now here is the second... Oh, did I just jump? Ah, oh, why does it jump like this? Now here is another, another flow. I'm just focusing on stuff that is not as familiar as what you all know from Europe. So these are the Rohingya. Now here's another uh, faulty explanation. So the, the, the explanation, suddenly this migration starts, and the explanation is anti-Muslim sentiment. In other words, you fall into familiar ground, you say, yeah, actually that makes a lot of sense, why? Why ask more? So I did ask more. I wanted to find out more. And so the Rohingya, small Muslim minority, have lived for centuries in Myanmar. Three or four years ago, something changed. Suddenly, you have a small Buddhist section, small, huh? who actually generates a doctrine that says, it is accepted by the Buddha or whatever, I, you know, I don't know exact language here, uh, to kill Rohingya, to murder. You understand, you have to stand back and say, my God, what happened to these Buddhists? That is simply not on her. And to accept that as the explanation, it, to me, it's like, this is stuff that I really find very irritating. It's probably also the academic in me, but it is also just the normal thinking person. Again, long history of peaceful coexistence, because they're small, they were, you know, etc. So what, so I again, I look, what's the larger operational space within which this sudden transformation happens? Well, guess what it is? It is massive land grabs, etc., etc. Myanmar, remember, opens up, right? So you have the Chinese, the Americans, all kinds of nationalities, big corporations, going for the mining, going for the land grabs, etc., the usual thing. Now, the, the main sufferers are the regular Buddhist Mi Myanmari, huh? and there have been, those of you who have followed the history of the last four or five years know that. There has been amazing displacement and evictions from their long-held land by mostly Buddhists, because the Rohingya are a small minority. So again, you have this weird thing that happens, that in order to find a guilty party, you wind up focusing on a small minority. It got so bad that actually the United States government took in 100,000 Rohingya just to protect them. So 
to me, the, the tragedy is also the distortion of at least that segment of the Buddhist population. When you go there and you actually speak with, with a lot of the small farmers who have been displaced, they are upset about having been displaced from their land. They don't care about the Rohingya. The Rohingya are in, so, so they become sort of the, the image, if you want, of what's wrong. Now here are some of the, these are Rohingya and they're also Bangladeshi, you know, the, that is a, because Bangladesh and, and, and Myanmar are sort of border, so there is a kind of an ambiguous zone there. Now I just wanted to show you, and so here you see some of the, you see the Southeast Asia migration crisis. Now what happens here in the Andaman Sea, which is a very big sea, you know, between Thailand, Malaysia, etc., you had what you had in the Mediterranean, which is ships, with thousands, you know, many, many ships, uh, abandoned often by, by the traffickers, where they were floating in the water, dying slowly, overloaded ships, exactly the same images we had about the Mediterranean were happening in the Andaman Sea. Thousands and thousands and thousands simply drowned, women, children, etc. So again, it's sort of a brutal history. And here you see the trafficking routes, because trafficking, and, and there is a whole sub, story which has to do with um, with Thailand, Malaysia, this zone here where they border. So uh, elements of that story which are sort of really constitutive of, of something that is happening there is that um, the Thais and the Malaysians of course have huge fishing industries. In the case of, the, of both of these um, uh, fishing industries, they literally go and sort of capture, uh, tie people from the high mountains, which are desperately poor people. So you have, I mean, thousands and thousands. A recent finding on the border, but mostly on the Malaysian side, you see Malaysia and Thailand here, uh, they found mass graves um, of, of workers who had been killed, died. No, actually, they are, not, they are not necessarily always killed, they also just die of hunger. So when they get uh, old, they just get rid of them. And so there are lots of local stories circulating. So this is so messed up. I don't know if you, I'm just trying to bring thickness of detail that these are not simple histories. Um, and this is yet another, see here you can see, this is the clear, see this is the Andaman Sea there that I was talking about. That Andaman Sea was functioning like the Mediterranean was functioning here. Now, here I want to get into some of the, the forces behind there, right? So one instance of what we measure as development, but is actually a massive sort of expulsion. And it has to do with land grabs. Now this is, this is worldwide measures and I have sort of uh, data, you know, after 2006. 2006 is an interesting uh, year. That is when we see the first wave of land grabs. And in the first half of 2006, the main buyers of land, and this is land in Asia, in Africa, a lot, it starts a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in Russia, in Eastern Europe, Europe, etc. The main buyers, over half of the buyers, are hedge funds. You know what hedge funds are? They're financial firms. They're not buying land to become farmers. They're speculating. And so you had Goldman Sachs buying land. You had J.P. Morgan. That's how I found out about this because I was doing work on finance. You know, I, the, when you go into the the little, there is a story behind each one of those acquisitions. You understand? So pretty. Um, and and for instance, um, some American financial firm. Probably now I realize it may be related to Trump, since Trump and you know what we're talking about, Trump and um, and Putin seem to be buddies of sorts. Um, uh, so they, they bought a vast stretch of land in Russia and they had to invent a set of firms in order to camouflage the fact that this was an American financial firm. <laughs> but I don't know exactly what, but when you read the stuff, it just sounds like it's a novel. You can't believe this is for, for real. Now, here, here are some of these images. So as you see, Africa, 
And this is land, actually, these are actually contracts that are executed, all right? Just look at the yellow ones. So you see, Africa is the main, but it also is happening. Europe actually is much more than this suggests because the, the patches of land are quite small in Europe. But for instance, at a time when France was having a lot of unemployment, uh, a lot of the youth, young people who were demonstrating, this goes back, you know, probably about seven years or something, some of them decided, I want to go back to farming, because farming can be a good life. And they were typically the sons and daughters of farmers. They could not buy rural land in France. It was sold. England. One of the big, there is a Swedish firm, in NHM or something, evidently a very nice firm, owned by a guy who is very nice. This is Swedish, I know that. Yeah. Um, and he bought a vast stretch of land in northern England, in the north of England, probably England, not just the UK. So, you know, when you begin to look, it's happening all over the place. This is not just some sort of thing about the global south. No, it's happening uh, quite a bit. Um, the Saudis have basically bought all the rural land in Bosnia, have offered, and, and the farmers in Bosnia, very poor, and they offered them good money, a retirement. So out there, gone, out, out, go to some nice warm climate and wheat fields. The Saudis and the Qataris are both building, coming in through south, southeastern Europe, which is Muslim dominated. They're building a sort of, I call it, this is my imagery, a silk road that goes across, you know, that by making big buildings. I don't know if people have tracked this. I'm about to write a story on this because many people are not aware of this at all. So you have a whole variety of sort of patterns. One effect, if there is something that they all share, is a significant displacement in bits and pieces that are sort of invisible. You know that we hear about the migrants coming to Europe, etc., but we don't really hear about some of this other stuff. Um, now... Africa, as you can see, is still the biggest, if you just look at it this way, you know, Asia, Latin America. And what is very interesting is the extent to which people think that it is mostly to grow agriculture. No, it is actually, a lot of it is for biofuels. And biofuels, uh, actually, you know, that is a very rough kind of treatment of the land, eh? that, that, so that that land will die pretty quickly. Now, this keeps growing, you know, this is a, this is a life story. So, what to me is very interesting, if you look at the statistics of those countries, each one of those acquisitions is, uh, winds up being a GDP per capita growth, a positive. You understand, right? So, you put all this plantation stuff there, you displace all those people who then come to Europe or wherever, but it reads like it's a positive for the country. This is a real problem. Now, you, some of you may know that there are a bunch of economists, including Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz, who are also uh, people that I, that I deal with quite a bit, uh, who have been calling for several years now to change the measures that we have to measure, supposedly, growth. GDP per capita is just one. Huh? Extremely problematic. And just as background, just not to leave it hanging like that, when you have an economy where growth means growth in the big middle, GDP per capita actually is a good approximation. When you have an economy where growth happens at this end, in other words, uh, the, you, know, you have accumulation at the top, and you have a growth of jobs that are at the lower end, then GDP per capita is not really measuring what is happening. I don't know if, if this was clear. So, so this is one of the issues for me that lies behind that third subject. Everything that I've been describing in a way is this third subject that, you know, we don't see also when these small farmers are displaced from their land. The first stop often is to the big cities which are closest to where they live. So they disappear, you know, we lose the knowledge even, and they become slum dwellers. Is the term slum dweller? Do you recognize that term, right? And so what we have lost are two things. One is we have flattened 
this, this, this farmer who really knew the land, who knew how to make that land have a life of centuries, huh? which today's plantations do not. And so we lose that knowledge and we lose the fact of these displacements. The best estimates we have is that every year, and it varies a bit year to year, we have between one and three million uh, rural people displaced from their land in the world huh, who then disappear in the cities. That's often the first stop. For some, they just go straight, you know, say to Europe or to wherever they might be fleeing to, the United States, whatever. This is, these are all global figures that I'm giving you. Um, now, these are, I think of these are two rising formats for our cities. So one of them is extraordinary concentrations of very high level, you know, construction, architecture, etc., enormous densities. And the other one is what we call in Spanish la periferia, which now is sort of referred to as the peri-urban. When you fly with a plane over Mexico City or whatever, you know, it looks like a desert full of little houses. When you move into that tissue, there's actually quite a bit of stuff happening, some very interesting stuff as well. Those people have knowledge. The, 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 there is enormous ambiguity as to who owns the land. There are limits to these peri peripheral developments. So for instance, in Sao Paulo, if you now are at the outs, at the edge, the external edge, it's impossible to make a living because you, ha you just can't get to jobs. So one mayor, there was a socialist mayor in Sao Paulo about 10 years ago, who put out information all over the country that was brilliant, saying, don't come to Sao Paulo because you will find, wind up in a place where you cannot make a living. Go to a smaller, medium-sized city. You know, these are people who had to leave. So when you look at this, when you look at the world, eh, these two formats are the rising and dominant formats. Well, this tells us a lot. Number one, the middle classes are also being expelled from that higher end. Some of them are winding up in the periphery. Others, of course, become migrants. Now, again, these are these migrants who are pushed by economic factors. We don't see them as migrants, and the law cannot see them either. And of course, here you're going to have at the edges growing miseries. These are unsustainable conditions the way we're doing it now. And, and um, well, enough on this. I think I don't need to explain more. You, you understand what this is about here. This is another version, of course. Both are dense, you understand. But, and the population keeps growing. These are unsustainable situations. This is in Venezuela. Habitat, trying to deal with some of this. And, and I know the, the head is the former mayor of Barcelona, Joan Claus, really a good guy. Huh? All that habitat can do is represented here, which is we are going to straighten out the streets, which is not bad, but they can't really do anything here because the ownership is very ambiguous. In some cases, you actually have a bit of law granting legally recognized ownership to here, but not always. There's also the difference between owning the little house and owning the land beneath the house. You understand what I'm saying, right? So what Habitat hopes to do is to, by, by having a certain kind of legality in intervening on the street, cleaning up, you see they cleaned up actually, you know, uh, that there can be a bit of a shadow effect of legality, so to say. And maybe at the edges they can begin to do something with these houses. But these are unsustainable conditions, you know, in the long run, if you want. That is not going to help. So that will also generate migrations. The periphery is already generating migrations, right? So the, the migration story is really... Now, then we have other modes. And I always like to say that that's a capability. This is a, these are now I'm showing you two very dramatic images of how we have succeeded in killing <laughs> major formations. So if we keep on, to, these are part again of that third subject that I'm talking about. Look at this in 20 years. This is the biggest, you all know about the RLC here, of course. I mean, this is extraordinary. You have to stand back and say, wow, 
That's impressive. That's a capability. My question, of course, is, <laughs> you know, could we develop, if we can do this, could we do some better things? Look at this. This is even more impressive. You understand? So when I use capability here, I refuse to attribute to capability that sort of embedded positive notion. Or in English, when you, I don't know what it is in Swedish. In English, when you say capability, it sounds like it can only be positive. I have my serious doubt about that. I think many capable, even now, they might be time one, they might actually be positive. I don't mean this, but others might be positive, but time two, who knows, right? So this is also, this is extraordinary what we succeeded in doing here. My question is, <laughs> if we were able to do this, you know, what else could we do? Uh, now, more... Moreover, the question of land. See, today I would say for that third subject that I'm talking about, that third emergent migrant subject, uh, the question of land is critical. Some land is going to be, you know, disappear because of flooding. Other pieces of land disappear because of, de of the desertification. So land becomes really a window into all kinds of possibilities. And it looks rather troubled. That is why Saudi, what I was saying before, for instance, Saudi Arabia is buying up wherever it can. Some, I repeat, South Eastern Europe is a lot of poor people there. They're just buying it up. Um, now, we have, know the story about warming, etc. Here you have it, right? I, I don't want to dwell too much, but this is all part of, I would say, a larger argument we need to construct about this third subject, this third migrant subject. We have got to connect some of these migrations, in other words, with that other history for which there is no legal regime. Um, these are all the areas in the world. This is like a very gross, you know, there is much, this, these are all images that come from my, my book. What are already limiting agricultural productivity? The United States. The United States, let me just dwell two minutes on that. You don't, you, you in Europe still are very, Western Europe, especially certainly Northwestern, etc., protected from all kinds of things that are happening. But in the United States, for instance, a vast patch of land in California that was still being producing whatever it was producing is suddenly dead. It's just finished. So I've been looking at the scientific literature in the Midwest of the United States, which is called sort of the heartland, which produced most of the grain, etc. If you drive through there, when the season is that it's meant to be green, it looks beautifully green. But the earth beneath, because all the pesticides and I don't know what, but the actual earth is getting hot, 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 hot. It's dying. It's going to go just like it happened in California. Suddenly it's gone. Because suddenly the fertilizer no longer work. So the Midwest, which calls itself the breadbasket of the world, you know, typical American modesty, um, it's dying. I mean, do you understand? This, this really, you know, that is a major side of production in the world. Now, if we implement it, all the, all the policies that we want to implement, you know, that are sort of the talk, the difference would be almost nothing. And we are not even there implementing. So all this policy talk, etc. I, I am interested in policy, policy is important, but it's not going to get us anywhere. We need such a radical transformation in, you know, in whatever, however we produce and we live our lives that this is really serious stuff. When you put all of these things, let's see, do I have another few negative things that are horrifying? Right, oh, this is the other one, right. Oh, Rick's, no, that is not an invented word. That is meant to be a risk. So, so you can see, these, so these are the, these, these measures are always problematic, by the way, huh? but these are supposedly, and now Colombia, of course, has the peace, <laughs> so it's a bit less over there, but these are places of extreme violence. I would include, of course, the United States, certainly the big cities, certainly given police, how police kill, right? I mean, police in Chicago kill about a thousand you know, people every year on the line of duty, so to say. So, so you can also say how Europe is literally at the heart of three continents. 
that that are that that mean a bit of trouble. Huh? So um, yeah. Now this is another data. This goes back again to that larger. So the the United Kingdom, you know, the nice civilized Brits. This indication, 96 countries in the world, 58 have declared independence from the UK, right? So here they are. That's a lot of countries. Well, guess what? Those countries have bridges with the UK. When you invade and you are the colonizer, hey, you have a bridge. You have access. You know, it's very interesting to see how migration... Why do so many Filipinos go to the United States, which is so far away from Philippines? Well, because the United States has military bases there. The United States, by the way, has military bases in over... has over a thousand military bases outside the United States. They, they are not formally listed, but it's not top secret either. Um, so... All of these, and then you can multiply France. You can bring in France with its imperial history. You, can bring, you know, we have over the centuries built very strong bridges. The migrants are going to, at some point, and they're doing it now partly, going to be using those bridges. Huh? So, so I think we have a we have a challenge. You know, that cannot be handled. I would say with the current. Now, then, fine. I want, I want to end. I don't know how much time I have. I mean, I am always at risk of speaking too much. But So, who owns all this stuff? I love that word, stuff. You understand that's not the most elegant word. Eh? Uh, this is also an issue. Now, this is one country, right? The United States. So, the top 10%. Eh? Now, you begin to break it down. Mean family wealth by race. Ooh, the white. Very, very well. Uh, median family wealth, median family wealth by race. What, 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 what is the difference between? This is lower. Anyhow, national wealth share by race. Ooh. So no matter how you look at the data, you are, you, you, you are actually seeing a lot of incredible inequalities that have not been solved. Now, that is just one little example. Each country has its own version of that. I know that the Scandinavian countries are known to be some of the most reasonable countries in the world. Uh, and Sweden is absolutely except. We're in Sweden, right? Because I came from Copenhagen, but we're in Sweden. Right, okay. So, <laughs> well, it got me confused. I thought I was going. I would, actually, I, my, that's right. What? So, so, um, so you are very reasonable here in this country, but most countries in the world are certainly not as reasonable as you are. And... Um, and so I just want to wrap it up. Maybe there are some questions. We can put some time into that. But I think that, um, I think that we really need to understand that we are making, constructing, building, developing the conditions for very significant flows of people. And we're not ready. I began to analyze uh, after Mare Nostrum was closed in the Mediterranean. You know what I'm talking, right? Towards the end of 2014, uh, the European Union leadership or the pertinent leadership says, okay, let's close Mare Nostrum. Just at the moment when these new flows of people were increasing. But it was not known yet. I, I don't think they did it on purpose. I think they've just made a strategic mistake. And then you have this massive number of people dying in the Mediterranean, you know, which then created like a hyper crisis. So, and, and then you see some of the other decisions that the European Union did. And I'm a supporter of the European Union, by the way, I should say. I mean, that doesn't mean that I support all the... I thought the way they treated Greece was disastrous. Uh, but still, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing to, to have. And you have a very interesting way of being part of that, of course, which I think is also a good, a good way of being part of it. But to me, I was struck with all the knowledge, all the smart people. It became like a microcosm, how the, the European Union, which is far better positioned to understand what the hell is going on here, unlike the Americans, let's say, kept missing the, this emergent new history. And so for me, this, this notion of this third subject, an emergent subject that belongs to this historical period, 
for a whole variety of reasons, and that is not recognized in law, you know, becomes a very important sort of priority for me to make this public, to make this visible. So I was very happy to have yet another audience to whom I could tell this story. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Do we have some questions or is it just the end and people just want to have coffee and cake? <laughs> Uh, I think there's time if there is one or two questions in the room. Um, it's it's a quite a, a striking um, uh, striking thought that you are sharing with us. Uh, we have a question here. Okay. Yeah, of course, it's it's very striking and disturbing. Uh, so I would like to ask you if you see any turning points, any uh, actions that should be taken, could be taken. Well, you know, it, it's really, uh, this is a difficult one. Partly because where I started out, how we measure economic growth, and economic growth for all governments, maybe there are some exceptions. Huh? Iran maybe doesn't care that much about it, but really is a critical variable. That is how they sort of understand whether they're doing well or not. So we have to start by rethinking economic growth. Now, on that vector, there are several vectors, but on this vector, so one, one thing that I'm involved in, which is really by now a global network, is the need to relocalize pieces of our economy. So one dramatic image that I like to use is, do we really need a multinational to have a cup of coffee in our neighborhoods? You know what I'm thinking about, right? Starbucks. Remember, every franchise takes something out. What you want is that the spending capacity, I'm not thinking about rich neighborhoods. Frankly, the rich neighborhoods, they can do what they want. I don't care that, though for the larger system, that's not good either. But, but um, the spending capacity of most of our localities should maximally recirculate in that locality. The second issue, the, and I work on a whole set of digital, I do a lot of digital work, um, digital application, so my, my latest project here, I did something for the Open Society, the Soros uh, Foundation, um, uh, digital applications that actually enable low-wage workers and low-income communities. Uh, and so one item there for me is, say, talking about immigrants, uh, you have often doctors, lawyers, people with training who are legally there, but it will take them years to, to get certified in whatever the country, right? In this case, the United States. I say, every low-income community... Now, remember, you don't have the, the messes that we have in the United States. In, this, in Sweden, you don't have that. But we have a lot of... It might as well be a very poor country where these neighborhoods exist, because they have nothing. So I say, every, every neighborhood, every locality should have a digital capacity to understand the knowledges in their neighborhood. So the doctor, I know these are real cases, is right now working as a parking lot attendant. That's his lawful job. But the community should know, we have a doctor. And in low-income communities in the United States, they have almost no medical options. Obamacare has helped. So, you know, so, and I have a whole set of such applications to enable low. But for me, that, this is just an illustration of this main point. A first step is how do we relocalize our economies? But, and then second, other interventions that begin to build a non-romanticized sort of network effect within these communities. Uh, I can give you another example, but maybe there is no time. You seem like you want to say something. I, want, yeah. I wanted to say actually that yeah. I think that your answer connects to the theme that you, you, you entered the scene and said now to something completely different. <laughs> and I think your answer really did reconnect to the idea of how recirculating and mobilizing local communities might be an answer to some global problems. Yeah. And I, th I think that's very relevant also to Sweden. And I think also that you, you might have a bit too romantic idea about a, a, a country with no problems. OK, <laughs> like what that. I say is not necessarily what I think, all right? But hey, I had to be a bit polite, yeah. <laughs> you know. 
and with it all, you are doing better. You know that the United States is very savage. So no, no, but I know that there are right. I have read also those novels, those amazing novels, and I have served on tribunals. You know, Bertrand Russell tribunals on on. Uh, on how the migration question plays out here, so I, I am aware of that. But I think there really is work to be done, and and to think that okay, the first step is to destroy destructive, uh, powerful corporations. That is going to be a very frustrating task. That it's not going to lead very far. So I think if you build up, I mean, what what I really find very problematic, and again, maybe the United States is a very extreme case, because I would say in Latin America, where I grew up it was not as extreme. And so what I describe here is that most people in the United States feel totally dependent on something that is not going to come forth, unlike, say, your you know, healthcare system and your social welfare system, you know, where actually the system is there and it works. But they, they feel like, they feel profoundly impotent. And, and that is why Bernie Sanders, you know, managed to mobilize so many people who were absolutely destroyed when, because there was hope, there was an alternative discussion. So what I find is that this bombardment of the media also, which are second rate, you know, in the United States, has, has made people feel that, you know, if you're not rich, glamorous, and famous, and slender, and I don't know what all, you really are... <laughs> No, there is a, a, a devaluing of the self that is enormous. So my interest is, how do we mobilize? So, so for instance, I also think that, that um, that's municipal governments should open source neighborhoods. Every neighborhood has knowledge about that part of the city that the central government doesn't have, you see. And, and, and basically, and, and so I say the grandmother, the child, the homeless person, the the whatever, you know, they all know something. How do you begin to, mob now this is very much for me an American story, huh? how do you begin to mobilize people into feeling, I can do it. So another application that, I, can I keep on chattering a bit? We're getting, so the final example, it's, it's, a, it's an application that is called, this is not my name, huh? uh, the emergency nanny. Now the emergency, you know the nanny, <clears throat> the emergency nanny, so most poor neighborhoods in the United States have workers who work in desperate kind of jobs where you, if you have a crisis back home, you can't just pick up the phone and begin to make telephone calls who can help you, you know, like, and so the emergency nanny is a little app that you can very, you can do that on the workplace. You can sort of, you have a crisis back in your home and you're on the job, you just click on that. The emergency nanny then passes it on to a group of people that you have selected as your emergency nanny. So it's in the neighborhood. So you take people who are static in the neighborhood, the little, the seller of a little shop, the hairdresser, etc., the policeman who is your cousin, that's dubious, but still. The butcher, you may not have one, the butcher to deal with your kids, you know, but still. <laughs> so, so, and then they mobilize. Now, I, my starting point is absolutely not romantic, so I'm Dutch, you know, very nuchter, huh? <clears throat> I'm not terribly nuchter, but anyhow. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I say this begins to, to make these people feel, the butcher, you know, that huh, I can be of some use. It begins to generate some sort of network effect. I am trying not to be romantic here. It's not about communities. I say neighborhood, locality. And that out of that can come other possibilities, like, you know, um, urban agriculture is a good example. In, in the United States, that has been very important to make people feel, I can actually, my neighbor and I can do something together. Because really, in, in poor communities, the neighbor is often the one person you can really hate <laughs> and cut her plants off. Of, I mean, you know, it's very sad, but we humans are a bit that way. So anyhow, there's a whole range of little interventions. So I, who've, I am, my, my main subject is finance, eh? high finance which I criticize. So I have tried to put out critical analyses of finance. You know, I always say finance is radically different from the traditional bank. The traditional bank sells something, it has money. Finance sells something it does not have. And hence, it's invasive. It's a logic of extraction. Finance, like Google. These are extractive sectors, like mining. Um, and so now I've really changed. And now I say, you know what? Forget about the very powerful sectors. 
Let's just work at what we can do. Because I think that will generate new histories, new forms of cohesion and trust that are practical trust, you know, not a romanticized trust. All right, I think I should shut up now. Thank was, you very, very much. It was a beautiful answer. Thank you very much. <laughs>